this video, I'm going to be building a super sleek white themed gaming PC build that is perfect for gaming at 1440p and 4K with an all white GPU, an all white motherboard and one of my favorite cases to release in the last year. This build's kind of crazy, but will it perform just as good as it looks? And are these parts actually sensible choices to pair with one another? Well, today we'll be finding out as I walk you through all the bits that make this build possible, how to assemble it from start to finish, and then look at those all important performance benchmarks later on. Let's do this. The Cooler Master Cube 500 flat pack is a case that lets you do it yourself with support for full size specs in a compact form factor. A highly adjustable design lets you build as you unbox and it really is like nothing else. What's more, support for up to E80X motherboards, 360mm long GPUs and a 280mm AIO up top make it super versatile for the latest components. Build it your way with the Cooler Master Cube 500 now available in black, white and macaron. Check it out at the first links in the description below. It's no secret that white PC components have been on the rise. The RTX 40 series is the first I can remember where all of the major brands have got a white skew of their GPU. Now in this particular build, I've got the Gigabyte Aero card and I may be a little bit biased because I've liked these Aero cards for a really long time, but I think it's one of the best white theme designs that exists full stop. As far as I'm aware, no brand's gone to the lengths of actually having a white heatsink. The heatsinks on these cards are still often silver, but the Aero does just about everything else right. You've got these large white fans on the front of the GPU, then you've got the really ridiculously beefy heatsink and a very very light shade of silver on the back plate. In the case today we'll be actually opting for a vertical GPU mount which means we'll see the front profile of the card in all its glory. And one thing I do really like too is that they've actually recessed the 12 pin PCI power connector. Often it's hard to find extensions for that 12 pin power cable and frankly something you don't really want to do. So having it recessed will allow us to hide the cable especially in a vertical config. Other than the fact the card is white, it is of course worth noting this is NVIDIA's latest RTX 4080 Super. And barring obviously that top end 4090 that commonly now sells for like $2,000, it's crazy, is NVIDIA's top end GPU. It's the most powerful card that they offer. With the launch of the Super GPUs, they dropped the price of this card down to $999 from $1299. We're not really seeing that filter through to retailers yet, so hold tight for a few weeks and hopefully they will be able to hit that MSRP. For this price, obviously it competes a lot more closely with the 7900 XTX. As I mentioned in our recent best GPUs video, I'd rather this over the 7900 XTX, purely because of the DLSS 3.5 and better ray tracing support. Now, before I get called out for being an NVIDIA fanboy, hear me out. This is so closely matched in terms of rasterization performance with the 7900 XTX for virtually the same price. I think going for this, even if it's very slightly more, does make sense. It's not like by gaining that RT and DLSS support that you're losing on straight rasterization performance and pure GPU horsepower. Now I have a funny feeling based on our review recently of this motherboard, the Z790 Aorus Pro X, that it's gonna be a perfect match for our Aero 4080 Super. And I only need to take it out the box to show you why. Oh my goodness. If there is an award for the best design motherboard this year, pfft, I mean, Gigabyte are really punching for it. Now in the future to really embrace that white theme, I'd like to see the RAM DIMM slots and some of our power connectors here be molded in white rather than black plastic. It's obviously possible because it's been done with the top GPU slot, ironically, the only one that's gonna be hidden. Once the RAM's in the stuff, you shouldn't really see it and we can't eradicate any black accent colors from the build, but it would be nice to see more and more of those internal components go white. There are a couple of features I do want to point out. The M.2 installation is the most tallest I've ever seen. Now you might think that's not much new, but all you do is push the notch back and the heatsink comes off. How easy is that? And even for the bottom here, one latch and the whole thing's removed. It's so unbelievably simple that I have to commend Gigabyte for their design here. The IO is also pretty good with Wi-Fi 7 at the top, our USB 3.2s and then our high-speed USB-Cs and a five gigabit ethernet port. So I don't wanna say the board's future-proofed, but it certainly has plenty of connectivity to serve you now and into the future. Now, as far as CPUs go for this build, I'm gonna give you guys two options or recommend two of the best parts to 
pick up. Now, the first is the i5-14600K. If you're purely looking for a gaming build and not really that bothered about doing anything else, this is going to work a dream. It gives you more cores, quite a few more cores actually, than what you'll find on the AMD rival here. And I'd say that the 14600K is more closely tied to a Ryzen 7700X than it is a Ryzen 5 7600X. If you do want a build that offers a little bit more, especially by way of streaming, video editing, or you're someone that just needs that extra CPU horsepower, jump up to the i7. In gaming, I don't think you're going to see a particularly distinguishable difference between these chips, at least not to justify spending that extra $100. We do, of course, get overclocking support with this being the unlocked 14600K. And of course, Z790, that should allow us to push that chip just a little bit further. 14th gen hasn't got quite as much overclocking headroom as what 13th gen had, because essentially 14th gen is kind of just overclocked 13th gen, apart from the i7, which obviously has those couple more cores. As far as RAM goes, again, a couple of options here for a gaming build. 32 gigs is going to be absolutely fine. This is the XPG Lancer kit. Personally, really, really like this kit. Corsair obviously have their Vengeance in white. We've also tried Lexar's white DDR5 kit. There are not a shortage of options if you're trying to tie into the color scheme, but I like the way that the RGB works on XPG's memory. This looks really, really great. Two 16 gigabyte DIMMs is going to be absolutely fine. As I say, you want that extra RAM bandwidth. Just pick up two packets. So you've got 64 gigabytes. Lower latency is obviously a lot better with DDR5, especially compared to its DDR4 counterpart. And you can see exactly why from an aesthetic standpoint, I chose this RAM. Next up, it's time for the M.2 drive and aesthetics here aren't quite as important because it's going to be hidden. I've gone for a two terabyte Samsung 990 Pro. Now, I really like this drive. It delivers really great performance and generally speaking is one of the best selling Gen 4 NVMEs for a reason. But it is a little bit more expensive. You're talking about $20 extra for the two terabyte versus the closest competition. There's definitely a bit of a Samsung premium there. I think it's a high quality drive. I think it's worth the extra cash, but it is not the best value option at this price point. And I think that's important to point out. This is where I could actually showcase how easy this is once again. So simply lift up the thermal guard, then drop the drive into place a little something like so. Use the tallest clip to actually secure the drive down first of all, and then add back into place our heat shield, push it down, and we're all good. How easy was that? Now with that, we should have ourselves a completed motherboard assembly. So you can see our CPU, RAM, SSDs under there, and of course then the board itself. At this stage, I would usually prep for the CPU cooler, but given how pretty easy our H150i Elite Capellix XT is to install, that's a bit of a mouthful, I'm going to move over into the case. And this is none other than Height's Y70 Touch. Height were obviously the big name in 2023 with their Y60, which was immensely popular, and the Y40, which went down well, but wasn't quite as well received. This thing builds on the Y60 in a really, really cool way. So you can see on the box here, there's actually a graphic, which is where the touchscreen, the integrated 4K touchscreen is on this case with a very similar design and form factor to the original Y60. So let me take it out of the box and I'll be back with you in a moment because it's, it's a bit of a beast. Now, would you just look at that? Let me show you a little bit around what the Y70 Touch is all about. Obviously got our tallest tempered glass panel that removes nice and easily. And then of course, one of the signature pieces about all height cases is the integrated vertical GPU mount. This is all pre-mounted and installed and has support for up to four PCIe slots worth of GPU. Support for full-size ATX motherboards with all of our cable grommets. And then of course, the top panel is also, I say easily removable as I struggle to take it off, unveiling where our radiator can go at the top of the case. Like basically all cases that are being released right now, this is a dual chamber case as well, which means that all the gubbins of the PC with the power supply and any storage drives are installed around the back. The only thing to note with this case is the lack of included fans. So you will have to go out. It's not a cheap case and you will then need to go out and spend more money on fans. So it's certainly not a cheap chassis to get going with. I think the idea is that people spending a lot of money on a case tend to throw away the fans anyway. Of course, if you want to trim some costs out this build, there are other great cases that you should consider instead. I'll pop some cheaper alternatives down below and you can watch our video too on the best cases to buy right now in the card section. Even though this is a really large case, I'm still going to lay it down flat on the table as installing the motherboard like this is a lot, lot easier. You can see the first thing I'm going to need to do is actually take out the vertical GPU bracket or at least unscrew half of it. You don't need to get this out the way fully, just make it loose so that the motherboard can slot underneath. Then grab our Aorus Pro motherboard, that's really quite heavy, and slide this into the case. Obviously all of our standoffs are in the right place because it's an ATX case and an ATX board. There we go. And once that's lined up, I am actually then going to return our vertical GPU mount PCI bracket into place. That's of course going to slot into the motherboard, a little something like so. Rescrew and secure that down so that's not in the way. And then we can go ahead 
head and secure the motherboard into place. Nine screws, three at the top, three across the middle and three down the bottom are going to make sure our motherboard doesn't go anywhere. Next up, it's time for the CPU cooler. Now, I mentioned earlier, this is Corsair's H150i Elite XT. It's not quite as high end as their new IQ Link, but it still looks really, really great. And looking at the build today, I think the top of the case makes the most sense. Now, what's quite clever is I believe it has a toolless or a simple screw out bracket. Aha, yes. So there's two thumb screws, which are a bit too tight. These need unscrewing or at least loosening in order for us to get access to that top radiator bracket. So yeah, aha, that is exactly what we need. Now that's taken out, that's gonna make installing the radiator a lot, lot easier. Now what I'm gonna do is flip the bracket upside down just for now and then add the radiator on the top a little something like so. The fans are gonna screw into the bottom of the rad so actually I can go ahead and screw the radiator in to this white bracket first of all. A bit of a top tip, if you actually hang this over the edge of a desk, that's gonna make it a lot, lot easier and gives you a place for you to dangle the tubes out the bottom of the radiator. Super simple. Having then added the fans as well, that's 320 mils to the bottom of the radiator, that should make the next stage super simple. Just drop the whole thing in. And then once you're confident the cables are fed, add this bracket back into place, just line everything up. And there we have it. That is all installed. Obviously need to add those two thumb screws back, but then we're pretty much good to go. Just the water block left for the CPU cooler. All that remains to do that is to pop the back plate through the rear of the motherboard before adding four posts around the actual CPU area itself. And then adding the water block on top and remembering of course to pop on a dab of thermal paste for good measure. This is gonna create that nice thermal bond between the water block and the CPU. Just gonna pop the top panel on while I'm here as well so I don't forget to do that. Yes. And then move around to pop in the GPU in. Now, I've been pretty excited to install the GPU. Take a look, we've got our bottom PCI riser slot at the bottom. Just make sure you push the clip back on that. And then for this build, by the looks of things, we only need to remove the first two PCI lanes. Looking at the back of the GPU and you can see it's just two lanes wide, the rest is all plastic extension. It's a little bit of a tight squeeze, but it looks to me, yes, like it's gonna fit. Good stuff, not loads of room to spare. And with the GPU aligned, we can simply push it into place, get that to latch and there we have it obviously needs a few screws to stop it from going anywhere but i think that looks amazing wow that aero card is so such a good fit for this build. With the GPU in, it is now time to pop that power supply in. Obviously one of the less exciting components in the build, but still really important. This is Deepcool's PX1000G, and it's one of the cheapest ATX3 PSUs on the market. Now you might be thinking, James, all the other parts are white. What's going on here? Now, this is a black PSU, but you aren't gonna see it as it'll be tucked around the back of the case. And I've actually picked up my favorite budget PSU cable extensions in the form of Easy DIY Fab set. Now this gives you a CPU, motherboard GPU group of cables. We don't need the GPU one, as of course we'll be using the integrated ATX3 connection with our deep core cool power supply. SATA power, we may need one of those a bit later, just for like RGB hubs and stuff. Motherboard power connector, definitely need one of those. Four plus four pin CPU, definitely want one of those. Another four plus four pin CPU, definitely want one of those. And then of course, our the holy grail, our 600 watt ATX3 connection. In the soft cell foam, all that then leaves is the power supply itself, and it's a bit of a unit. It is a thousand watts. This will be fine for even like an i9 and a 4090 combo but because you're only paying about 125 for this at least at the time of filming latest pricing will be in the description below there's not really any need to go for anything with a necessarily lower wattage as this gives us the upgrade options without breaking the bank then just a case of sliding the power supply and get it all lined up the fan is going to pull air in through the rear panel and then four screws to secure the whole thing into place i'm then going to go ahead and plug up the cpu cable to the top left the motherboard to the right hand side and then of course our gpu cable which can be a bit more tricky to the back of our Aero 4080 Super. All those cable extensions will be linked down below and they just slot onto the end of your existing cables. And with that, we're pretty much there. I do need to add in some fans, one rear exhaust fan, and then of course two or three down the side to give us more airflow and better aesthetics out the front. And I think I'm going to use Corsair's UL Edition fans, which have the RGB on both sides, so I can put those ones over there in intake with exhaust at the top. There's only really one way to see how good this build looks though, and we'll take a closer look at that touchscreen in just a moment. It is of course montage time.
Well, what do we think? A build that looks like nothing else really on the market. Now, before looking at performance, I want to touch a little bit, no pun intended, on the screen of this case. The 4K touchscreen actually acts as an external Windows display, so you can theoretically put whatever you want on here, but Heights Nexus software manages it in a way that's a lot more usable for most people. For example, you can monitor CPU and GPU temperatures, you can look at the time, the weather, and even play a game of Tetris, because uh, who doesn't want to play Tetris on their PC? You get media control, which are perhaps the most valuable, I would say, for most people while you're gaming to play and pause music or mute yourself on Discord. And with loads of different configuration options within the Nexus software and expanding, the use cases of this touchscreen are only going to grow. Do I think it's overkill that it's 4K? I mean, absolutely. This thing is sharper than most monitors we get to use, but the screen looks good. The colors are vibrant. And I have to say, even though you paid a lot of money to have the privilege of the screen, I don't think Height have done a bad job here at all. Now, in terms of performance, you'll be glad to know this build does stack up pretty well. 4K across the board is where we tested. Where frame gen was available, we turned it on. The reason being that we think NVIDIA frame gen is really, really fantastic, as long as you're not playing an esports or FPS oriented title. Now, Alan Wake 2 is the first game we tested. 4K, high settings, and the build did pretty well. 103 FPS on average. I say pretty well as though 100 FPS at 4K isn't amazing, but that's going to set the expectation for how good some of the performance really does get here. Call of Duty Warzone was next. We did use DLSS, no frame generation, obviously not supported here but you wouldn't want to use it anyway with that DLSS set to quality at 4k high. The build achieved 139 FPS on average with consistent 90 and 99th percentile results too. Modern Warfare 3 was very similar, no surprise these games are much alike one another in their back end makeup. 4k high with DLSS set to quality and Modern Warfare 3 pulled in 143 FPS on average. Starfield was next up, 4k high settings. The build struggled a little bit more, more down to Starfield's poor optimization than anything else. 77 FPS on average. That is a pretty paltry frame rate at 4K. And while obviously this is not an FPS intensive title, it would still be nice to see those frames pushed a little bit further. Hogwarts Legacy at 4K high did slightly better, but not massively different with 82 frames per second on average. Consistent 90 and 99th percentile results once again with all of our frame rate data gathered using NVIDIA FrameView and MSI Afterburners Reva Tuner in tandem. For a bit of fun, we also booted up Fortnite because why not and turned it down to basically 1080p low with the render distance set to far. Here the build well surpassed 300 FPS with 321 frames per second at 1080p. It sounds funny, but with more and more 300 Hertz plus 1080p monitors hitting the market, for some people, this might actually be a useful metric. Apex Legends was also amazing, back up to 4K high, and the build achieved just shy of 180 FPS, 179. I mean, wow. The game looked fantastic, super competitive at 4K. It's great to see. And finally, to wrap things up, my personal favorite game, save the best till last, Formula 1 2023 at 4K, ultra high, DLSS enabled, quality preset on, and the build achieved 169 FPS. Wow, the game looks so, so good. We did use the benchmark mode as well, so you can easily compare this result against other builds we've put out before. Talking of which, if you like PC builds, why not stick around, get subscribed, drop a like rating, let me know what you think of this build in the comments down below. And as always, we'll see you in the next one.